So, um, well, welcome everyone to the event Fake News and the Rupture of Democracy, a World Phenomenon, hosted by Kingsborough Institute as part of, part of the week of fake news. Um, I am Arthur Galamba, lecturer in science education at the School of Education Communication Society at King's, and deputy director of Kingsborough Institute. And I will chair the debate today. Uh, the week of fake news is organized by Victor Fraga, a journalist and filmmaker, founder of and director of the D Movies and director of the documentary, The Coup d'Etat Factory. I'd like to thank you, Victor, for organizing such a timely and uh, important debate about fake news and democracy. So I'd like to ask everyone to do give a round of applause to Victor because the fantastic organization. Thank you very much. Um, we are really delighted to welcome to King's Master Tiburi, a well-known philosopher and writer from Brazil. She has written extensively about fascism and how to deconstruct its narratives. She is currently living under exile in Paris and works as a philosopher, sorry, as a professor at the University of Paris 8. I'm also delighted to have with us tonight from Barcelona, Jean Willis, an award-winning journalist who served two consecutive terms as congressman in Brazil and now does research on fake news and the right of authoritarianism governments. And last but not least, we are fortunate to have Priscilla Curry with us, uh, a paramedic for the NHS in London and the founder of the Dehuba as Fake News campaign, um, composed of a group of doctors, scientists and health experts who fight fake news. Before I proceed, I'd like to thank very much André Michelazzi, who is a PhD student at the Kingsborough Institute. It's been of an amazing help tonight. Thank you, André, for being here with us. And also, uh, Julie Spat Spatuzzi, who has volunteered to interpret for us tonight. So thank you very much to the two of you. Without you, we would not be able to run this event. Thank you very much. So I need to say a few words before I pass, that, um, pass on to, uh, to Jean and Marcia and Victor and Priscilla. So I need to say that the title of our event does not refer to fascism, but I know we will inevitably talk about it tonight. I say this not only because of Masha's extensive work on fascism thinking and mechanisms in the 21st century, but also because fake news is one of the main strategies used by fascists to create chaos, disinformation and confusion that interest them. Fascism is an overloaded term with little consensus in the literature about what defines its forms of government. In the 20th century, Europe, for instance, Mussolini's, Hitler's, Franco's and Salazar's regimes have all been described as fascist, authoritarian, nationalistic and violent, led by a charismatic leader, but they had clear different expansionist and militarist aims. They are not the same. Umberto Eco and Madeleine Albright have both warned us the forms of fascist government that we saw in Europe and South America in the last century are unlikely to return. But looking at Russia and Brazil today, I'm not too sure they were right. They were right, however, in saying that we must keep ourselves vigilant about a somewhat nebula of obscure, culturally nurtured instincts that underpins fascist thinking. These invariably include hatred, xenophobia, misogyny, homophobia, and racism, which nurture intolerance and bigotry. They nurture what Umberto Eco calls er fascism or eternal fascism. Those feelings are difficult to tackle because they are detrimental enough to cause a lot of pain in many people, but not radical enough to be overwhelmingly unacceptable. So in modern literature, fascism related ideological supporters are sometimes referred to as the far right. In particular, the alt-right, which is a term that is used to refer to white nationalists movements based in the United States, they pursue ethno-national purity. They hold reactionary gender roles, value top-down policies, are violent, explore the preponderance of white men, advocate male entitlement and display a racist will to power capable of eradicating weakness and opposition from all parties. Well, 
taken separately, the social roots of misogyny, xenophobia, homophobia, and racism cannot be accounted for by fascist ideologies only. But the high degree of concern that, we, that the rise of fascism in Europe and in the Americas deserves is because the terms encapsulates and even advocates all those forms of violence together. Problematically, fascism or fascist-like ideologies are a political power that's built upon a conglomerate of feelings that generate intolerance and exclusion, which have been strategically used by politicians to get elected. It's not only a matter of cultures of structured oppressions, to use Paul Frey's words, that's passed on from generation to generation. It is a matter of how the world built on individualism, selfishness, and indifference to fellow human rights. And dignity has been cunningly manipulated to grab power to obliterate progressive sustainable agendas. Therefore, I believe we should not only be interested in understanding and tackling the roots of detrimental thinking and behaviors that can be found in individuals, but also in tackling a political view which can concretely manage a huge amount of government assets to target people and remove from their rights to live a safe, free, fulfilling, and flourishing life. Now, I work with education. So being an educationalist myself and a scientist too, I'm also deeply worried about the fascist anti-intellectualism and anti-intelligence ideology. During my PhD, I studied the work of Romulo de Carvalho, a Portuguese educator during the Salazarist regime. And I was astonished how Salazar dismantled Portuguese science and targeted university professors such as Bento de Jesus Caraça, who died actually at the age of 48. They also sought to control school curriculum. It's impossible not to see similar activity happening in Brazil today. With dramatic cuts in the budget of scientific research and the scholars in Partido movement, for example. <laughs> As Massa Tiburi tells us in her book, Psycho Culture and the Opinions of Everyday Fascism, fascists are averse to critical thinking, to complex dialogues, to academic work, to rich vocabulary. They, they simplify world, narrowing it down to binary terms, such as good, bad, black, white, women, men. It reminds me of what George Orwell's 1984 book called Newspeak, a method used by a totalitarian system to get rid of complex words, to reduce language to poor vocabulary and elementary syntax, and remove from people any chance to think critically and build strong arguments against the system. I had constantly wondered what we can do to educate youngsters and adults against fascist traps, against hate speech that divide us. So I should ask Marcia, how can we talk to fascists? <laughs> how can we talk to our loved ones, uh, friends, family who are lenient to fascism? Right in 1997, and I'm coming to an end now, Right in 1997, Umberto Eco says we must forgive, but not shall, sorry, we must forgive, but shall not forget as fashion is still around us. We must continually listening uh, and talking to them as distance, distancing from them means the victory of fascism. We need to show some kind of empathy to understand how they think and what takes them to radicalize. It's not easy, I know, but this is our main objective. Finally, it's not worthy that democracy recognize all kinds of views, fascist and authoritarian views included. Therefore, democracy should be continuously developed and strengthened so that at, at its heart, it values mutual respect, tolerance, and understanding of others in order to further a society that's open and transformative. Nurturing and protecting those values is a way to counter the growth of fascist related views. Thank you for listening to me. Um, I feel very good at saying that to this audience tonight. Um, I, I would like to invite Jean, Jean Willis. Jean, I would like to thank you again very much to be with us. Um, your work is obviously much appreciated by many of us. Uh, and uh, your fight against fascism is absolutely really necessary. Thank you for that. So 
um, it's the, the floor is with you. Um, please uh, welcome, welcome to Kings. Muito obrigado ao Kings College, muito obrigado e a todos os meus colegas nessa mesa. Quero agradecer, eu vou só é, um momentinho é, silenciar o áudio da tradução. Wait a minute, so you can come back, John. É, um momentinho. Great, ok. Don't run away. Pronto. É, boa tarde a todas e todos vocês, todos também. A meus amigos Márcia Tiburi e Vitor Fraga, Vitor, por, por ter elaborado essa semana para pensar esse fenômeno. Bom, é, em 2018, em 14 de março de 2018, Marielle Franco, uma ativista de direitos humanos negra, nascida na favela da Maré, no complexo de favelas da Maré, e que foi, durante um tempo, assessora de um proeminente político carioca, proeminente político fluminense, chamado Marcelo Freixo, de esquerda, Marielle Franco, que havia se elegido em 2016 como vereadora é, da cidade do Rio de Janeiro, saiu de um evento em um lugar chamado Casa das Pretas, uma ONG que, cuja casa foi construída, inclusive, com recursos é, colocados pelo meu mandato, quando eu era deputado. Marielle saiu dessa casa, entrou no seu carro e, minutos depois, encontrou a morte da forma mais brutal. O carro dela foi interceptado e uma rajada de metralhadora destruiu a cabeça dela e matou também o motorista Anderson Gomes, que dirigia o veículo. Sobreviveu desse atentado político sua assessora Fernanda. A notícia de que uma vereadora havia sido executada de forma brutal numa emboscada no Rio de Janeiro, despertou imediatamente uma comoção nacional. As pessoas, é, de maneira orgânica, sem organização nenhuma, foram às ruas, indignadas com o que havia acontecido. Muitas dessas pessoas que foram às ruas não conheciam Marielle Franco. Ouviram falar dela pela primeira vez, não os que elegeram ela no Rio de Janeiro, mas as, as outras pessoas do Brasil estavam ouvindo falar dela pela primeira vez, e a imagem dela, uma mulher negra, bonita, com cabelo black power, estampou a, o noticiário é, televisivo e na internet. Bom, as pessoas ouviam falar pela primeira vez e estavam chocadas com a brutalidade da morte de Marielle Franco. Mais ou menos quatro horas depois da execução de Marielle Franco, um perfil apócrifo, ou seja, sem assinatura, é cujo IP, o endereço digital, se desconhece, é, utilizou a foto de uma... Ah, é importante dizer que, claro, quando se noticiou a morte de Marielle Franco, noticiou-se que Marielle Franco tinha uma filha, Luiara, é, e que Marielle Franco era é, oriunda do complexo de favelas da Maré. Bom... É, quatro horas depois, esse perfil apócrifo no Facebook é, pegou uma foto, uma fotografia de uma moça muito mais branca, de pele muito mais branca que Marielle Franco, grávida, sentada no colo de um rapaz branco também, ou de pele clara, mas evidentemente pobre. Eles estavam num bar, o típico bar de periferia, cadeiras de plásticos, de plástico, é, a moça estava sentada no colo desse rapaz. Essa foto, ao lado dessa foto, aparecia a seguinte informação, entre aspas. É, esta é Marielle Franco, grávida de vacinho VP aos 16 anos, a nova heroína da esquerda. Ela foi executada por se engajar com bandidos. Esse perfil apócrifo, essa notícia, foi publicada, retuitada por todos os perfis de extrema-direita, principalmente os perfis dos ativistas de extrema-direita, o MBL, o Vem Pra Rua e o Na Rua, que eram organizações de extrema-direita que ajudaram a perpetrar o golpe de 2016 contra Dilma Rousseff. 
É, e junto com esses perfis que publicaram é, essa, essa notícia, essa fake news, autoridades da República, como o deputado federal é, Alberto Fraga e a desembargadora Marília Castro Neves, desembargadora do TJ, do Tribunal de Justiça do Rio de Janeiro, portanto, uma autoridade do judiciário e uma autoridade do legislativo, também publicaram em, seu, em seus perfis a notícia de que Marília Franco havia sido executada porque estava engajada com bandidos. Ou seja, é, a execução, eles, a, a, o objetivo da, da, dessa mentira, que foi é, é, que quatro horas depois, quatro horas depois da execução dela, começou a circular, tinha o objetivo, primeiro, imediato, de justificar o assassinato político, né, o crime político, é, de justificá-lo numa razão pessoal, privada, ou seja, ela teria sido morta porque ela estava engajada com bandidos, e. É, ao mesmo tempo que, 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 que fazia isso, drenava-se a empatia que a execução despertou orgânica e imediatamente. Então, muita gente que ficou chocada com a execução da vereadora, quando leu a notícia, essa notícia falsa, essa fake news, é, pensou, imediatamente a empatia foi embora, porque pensou, bom, essa moça grávida de 16 anos de um traficante é, foi morta por causa das relações com esse traficante. Detalhe, Marielle Franco é, era casada com Mônica Benício. Teve a filha, Luiara, mas o pai do, de Luiara não é traficante e muito menos nascia um VP. A moça da foto não, não se parece nem de longe com Marielle Franco. E o rapaz da foto não se parece com Marcinho VP, o famoso traficante. Contudo, na foto... É, a, contudo, a foto trazia signos, né? e aí eu fazendo signos no sentido semiótico do termo, não no sentido do, do zodíaco, trazia signos de identificação da pobreza, ou seja, e, produz, e, permitia, uma e permitia uma operação semântica que era é, toda todo pobre, toda preta, mulher, toda mulher preta é igual. Os corpos negros não têm individualidade, eles são iguais e por isso há tantos negros acusados injustamente, porque quando uma pessoa é assaltada, ela a primeira descrição que ela faz, ela diz: assim, "Foi um negro". E aí essa categoria um negro inclui todos os negros. Então, é, a operação era essa. Bom, ela essa deve ser Marielle de fato, porque Marielle nasceu na Maré, no Complexo Favela da Maré. Portanto, aqui, esses signos da pobreza, a cadeira de plástico, a casa, reboca, a casa sem reboco, é uma favela. Marielle foi mãe, é mãe de Luiara, portanto, deve ter engravidado mesmo aos 16 anos, e ela estava envolvida com, com um traficante. Bom, essa operação semântica, claro, era, é, é, drenou, buscava drenar a empatia, e assassinar uma segunda vez Marielle Franco, dessa vez assassinar sua reputação é, e desqualificar o caráter político do assassinato. Marielle Franco foi executada é, sob uma intervenção militar no Rio de Janeiro, uma intervenção que foi chamada de intervenção federal, mas que, na verdade, era uma intervenção militar pensada por Michel Temer, o presidente golpista, que golpeou Dilma Rousseff, é, e, e essa operação, essa intervenção é, militar na segurança do Rio de Janeiro foi conduzida pelo general Braga Neto, ou seja, Marielle foi executada sob a intervenção militar, militar do general Braga Neto, que depois é, se torna ministro da Casa Civil de Bolsonaro e agora ministro da, da Defesa. É importante também é, é, saber que, meses depois, de investigação, descobriu-se que os assassinos de Marielle Franco viviam no condomínio Vivendas da Barra, eram vizinhos do presidente da República. E na casa deles, de um deles foi encontrado um arsenal de 17 fuzis. Bom, mas nos interessa as fake, aqui nos interessa as fake news, certo? É, esse exemplo que eu dei é um exemplo cabal de como se dá, é isso que eu chamo no, no, na minha na minha tese de doutorado, que ainda vai ser defendida, mas que eu estou elaborando, isso que eu chamo de economia 
é, da desinformação programada e dirigida para fins de lucros políticos e ou financeiros. Dá conta de toda essa economia, de como ela se move, ou desse ecossistema digital. Para que uma... Ah, então, só para ser mais um pouco pedagógico. Então, portanto, esse nome fake news, que é, ele passou a, a, a significar não só notícia falsa, né? seja a notícia falsa, é, essa notícia falsa sobre a Marielle Franco, seja aquelas notícias falsas que têm, minimamente, que, só, que têm o objetivo tão somente de obter é, clique, né? de, de obter audiência, como dizer que ETs foram encontrados na cidade de Varginha, ou um homem nasceu com dois pênis. Essas coisas que aparecem na internet e que, e que movem uma economia também, que as pessoas, esses sites de, de, de fake news, de notícias falsas, essas notícias falsas, digamos, inócuas, elas, elas trazem uma rentabilidade, porque na medida em que você acessa é, o algoritmo das mídias, das plataformas digitais, colocam ali a publicidade naquele, naquele espaço, naquele site, é, naquele perfil, e claro, a pessoa ganha quando a publicidade vai para ali. Então, fake news representam, é, representa, essa expressão representa não só as notícias falsas propriamente ditas, né? É, sejam mais inócuas, sejam essas como a que foram feitas, essa que foi feita sobre a Marielle Franco, mas inclui outras formas de desinformação. Então, a fake news está é, dentro de um processo contemporâneo de desinformação perpetrado por novas tecnologias da comunicação e da informação que tornam a propaganda muito mais insidiosa, muito mais capilar e muito mais controladora. E, claro... É, mostra as, as, as interseções, o, a, a circularidade entre a, o, o mundo digital e o mundo analógico. No caso do Brasil, uma das características da, do, dessa economia é que ela, as, as redes digitais de tráfico, de, de, de desinformação, de fake news, de mentiras e outras fraudes digitais, ela, ela se articula, ela se sobrepõe com uma rede analógica de igrejas neopentecostais que operam como divulgadoras é, é, presenciais, no, no, na experiência presencial real, dentro da igreja, é, das mentiras e das fake news. É, então, percebam, como um, um evento desse não, afet, não afetaria a democracia? É óbvio. O assassinato de Marielle Franco já era, no caso do Brasil, para ficar no caso do Brasil, um atentado à democracia. O golpe de 2016 já havia sido um atentado à democracia brasileira. A democracia brasileira já estava sendo, portanto, estava é, é, sendo corroída por dentro, por uma espécie de parasita, né, de câncer. É, eu sei que a Susan Sontag não gosta das metáforas em torno do câncer, mas é inevitável é, fugir dessa metáfora. Mas um câncer que começou a vigorar ali nas, nas, nas entranhas da própria democracia e minar as forças dessa democracia. E, claro, quando, quando uma, um, um ecossistema, quando uma economia de desinformação programada e dirigida busca desqualificar o caráter político de um assassinato de uma parlamentar, essa, essa economia está atentando contra a democracia. Ela está atentando contra a, a, o dever de toda a democracia, de toda a república democrática, de esclarecer crimes dessa natureza, quando não, e preferivelmente, de impedi-los. Né? É, e também porque, claro... É, como eu disse, produz uma segunda morte. Uma segunda morte. Marielle experimentou uma segunda morte, que foi o assassinato da sua reputação. Ela que era corretíssima, honestíssima, uma mulher negra, uma potência, viu, viu não, sua família teve que vir a sua reputação ser destruída, mal seu corpo havia esfriado no IML, no Instituto Médico Legal. Então, essa economia, e esse, esse, essa economia ela, ela, ela foi 
ela, digamos assim, ela se desenvolve, ela se engendra numa apropriação, numa colonização da internet é, pelo capitalismo neoliberal, que vai que sofre uma mutação e vira um capitalismo de plataforma ou um capitalismo de vigilância, fazendo das plataformas de comunicação digitais superiores aos, aos próprios estados-nações. A resposta de Elon Musk, diante de uma acusação feita por um seguidor seu, de que ele havia financiado o golpe na Bolívia, porque ele tem interesse num, num minério, que é fundamental para a construção dos carros da Tesla, a empresa dele, que, tá, que tem a mudança na Bolívia, então ele tinha interesse na exploração desse recurso natural, quando ele foi acusado de financiar o golpe na Bolívia, ele disse que nós damos golpe onde a gente quiser. Ou seja, e, esses são os estados-plataformas hoje. Dessa maneira, esses estados-plataformas têm solapado a democracia ou sequestrado a democracia em diferentes partes do mundo. E, claro, esses estados-plataformas fazem isso com grupos políticos ou ideologias políticas que são que têm afinidade com seus propósitos e objetivos. Então, por isso que essas plataformas encontram nos grupos de extrema-direita, nos partidos de extrema-direita, os seus títeres dentro dos, dos países que vão desenvolver o discurso antidemocrático, é, ultraliberal e antidemocrático. Um discurso que ataca o Estado do bem-estar social e converte, ao mesmo tempo, o Estado num mero braço armado de garantia dos privilégios das aristocracias eh, e dos plutocratas. Né? E esse Estado, esse braço armado, ele, ele, é, ele, ele, ele se arma para o extermínio real, para aquilo que o, 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 o aquele Membebe vai chamar de necropolítica numa num jogo que ele faz com a noção de biopolítica de Foucault. Né? Quer dizer, não é mais um poder que incita e controla a vida, mas um poder que engendra a morte, a morte dos é, excedentes. Né? Então, os indígenas que são é, considerados, apesar de toda a resistência, da resistência é, centenária dos povos indígenas contra a colonização, de sua resistência, eles são considerados um estorvo a esse capitalismo neoliberal, a esse capitalismo de plataforma que que é esse capitalismo de corporação que quer se apoderar privadamente dos recursos de todas as nações. Então, exterminar os povos indígenas, é, 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 na, na perspectiva deles, é tranquilo, porque o que interessa para eles é o minério que está ali naquelas terras, além da madeira. Exterminar os negros, né, a, a, o excedente de negros, a, o excedente não encarcerado de pretos pobres também, e por isso a gente viu agora, dois dias no Rio de Janeiro, mais uma chacina, quarta, me parece, do ano, em que 20, mais de 20 pessoas foram mortas numa operação policial em que nenhum policial saiu ferido é, dessa operação. Óbvio que essa... E, e o Brasil é um país recorrente nessas chacinas. E aí a lógica da classe média é, forjada, cuja subjetividade está forjada na comunicação de massa e agora nessas novas tecnologias da comunicação que produzem novos processos de resubjetivação, essa classe média, sobretudo, alivia a, a sua culpa, a, a sua consciência, digamos assim, alivia a sua, a sua consciência com os clichês típicos oferecidos por essa imprensa, por essa... É, por essa é, imprensa e por esses meios, né? que é a ideia de que todas aquelas pessoas é, que foram mortas são bandidas. Claro, porque você ser preto e morar na favela já faz de você um bandido. Né? Então, é dessa forma. Então, é, essa é a grande questão. Como, como o processo de desinformação não vai afetar as democracias? A gente viu agora, para sair do exemplo do Brasil e pegar o exemplo mundial, é todo o enfrentamento que o mundo teve que fazer com a economia da desinformação em torno da Covid-19. Né? A, 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 a visibilidade e o impacto que o movimento anti-vax teve em todo o mundo, baseado em teorias da conspiração. Sim, porque é, a desinformação inclui as fake news, as notícias falsas, e, e as teorias conspiratórias. Né? É, assim, a, e a teoria conspiratória ela, ela faz sucesso, assim como as fake news, as fake news fazem sucesso porque interpelam preconceitos que já estão ali, né? reforçam preconceitos, lugares comuns, é, preconceito é uma falsa certeza, então 
a fake news reafirma essa falsa certeza, quase sempre partindo de um elemento de verdade, esse elemento de verdade em torno do qual se constrói toda a mentira, esse elemento de verdade ele é fundamental para abrir, para abrir a subjetividade da pessoa e reprogramá-la e reforçar seus preconceitos. É, então, as fake news fazem isso e as teorias conspiratórias dão sentido ao, àquilo que é caótico, aquilo que é acaso. Né? Então, para as pessoas é muito mais fácil acreditar que existe uma grande conspiração global judaica de judeus, o, o priorado de Sião, que está por trás da Covid-19, do que acreditar na, na coisa mais na, na, na explicação mais racional, ou seja, nós estamos nos expandindo como, como, como população, estamos invadindo a, o habitat de outras espécies, e esse contato humano e, a, e o modelo de desenvolvimento nosso nos está colocando em contato com vírus que nós não tínhamos contato antes. E claro que esses vírus podem gerar uma pandemia, então, essa é a explicação, mas as pessoas não querem a explicação, elas não querem a explicação é, do, do, da contingência da vida e, e os esforços da ciência de, de entender essas contingências. Não, elas preferem acreditar na, na, na mentira, porque elas demandam por esse sentido, por essa compreensão. Daí, as, as religiões, as, as grandes religiões, elas, elas têm tantos adeptos, né? porque as pessoas não lidam bem com o fato de que vão morrer e elas não sabem o que, o que é morrer depois. Então, elas é, desaparecer desse mundo é um, uma dor, é uma violência an antropológica tão, tão primeira que, é, que as pessoas inventam para si uma série de narrativas para justificar isso. Por fim, para não me me estender mais, eu acho que eu já passei do, do meu horário. É, é interessante, a, o, o, o antissemitismo e a homofobia existe, existem, são milenares. Né? É, o antissemitismo e a, e a homofobia nascem praticamente juntas, embora a homofobia não tinha esse nome. É, quando os, os, os judeus, os antigos judeus, é, quando os povos semitas é, transitavam pela Palestina, mas o ato, a atitude em relação às práticas homossexuais, elas já existiam. Então, é, no, no fascismo, tanto o fascismo histórico quanto o neofascismo, né, o nazifascismo da, da agora, eles não, eles não, a homofobia não é criada, não foi criada por eles, mas eles é, se apropriaram, ou seja, o fascismo é um terreno fértil para esse sentimento da homofobia e do antissemitismo, porque o fascismo trabalha com a ideia é, da demonização do outro, né? o nós contra eles, os eleitos contra os não eleitos, é, os que têm privilégios, os que são raça pura e os impuros, ou seja, toda, todo esse binarismo, essa noção binária que justifica uma violência e, ju e, e, ao mesmo tempo, justifica os privilégios. E, por fim, eu não acho, é, eu discordo de Humberto Eco quando ele fala de perdoar, fascistas. É, eu não, eu, aí nesse sentido, eu fico com Hannah Arendt. Perdoar quem perdoa é Deus, porque só Deus tem a magnanimidade e a potência de perdoar alguém de, de, pelos atos criminosos e escabrosos que ela fez. Nós, humanos iguais a essas pessoas, no máximo que podemos fazer com essas pessoas é nos reconciliar, não perdoar, porque isso pressupõe, inclusive, um, um poder que eu não tenho de livrar a pessoa de uma culpa. Eu não sou Deus. Só na cabeça dos evangélicos é que eles se livram da culpa de seus pecados quando é, se batizam e nascem, renascem para o mundo, aceitando Jesus como seu inteiro e único salvador. Mais uma narrativa muito confortante para os criminosos, para aqueles que cometeram é, seus crimes. Então, nessa perspectiva, eles podem achar que a culpa deles foi liberada por esse perdão nós não vamos perdoar. O que nós podemos fazer é nos reconciliar. E a reconciliação implica responsabilização e, quando muito, reparação. Então, eu não vou... Não quer dizer que eu não vou conversar com os fascistas no Brasil, mas eu não vou perdoá-los. Nunca. Eu vou me reconciliar e vou me reconciliar na medida em que a gente... é Que, a, que essa reconciliação pressupunha responsabilização. Foram 600 mil pessoas mortas. For, foram é, lideranças indígenas executadas. Hectares de floresta queimados. É, roubo e corrupção nos ministérios. 
É, do, no, se eu falar individualmente, a minha vida, a minha vida mudou completamente por causa dessa economia. Quer dizer, eles me tiraram um futuro. Ainda bem que eu tenho uma capacidade enorme de reinvenção e de sobrevivência, porque eu pertenço à raça da pedra dura, porque eu vim do Brasil profundo, da pobreza, da resistência. Eu sou esse Brasil. Mas eles me tiraram o um futuro. E, por isso, eu não vou perdoá-los. Nunca. Nem esquecer. No máximo, me reconciliar. É isso. Muito obrigado. All right, just like this. Yes. Can you all hear me okay? Wonderful, great, great. Well, my name is Victor Faga. I'm a journalist and I'm a filmmaker. We have an incredible selection of panelists who are going to provide a very, very, very different view on fake news, on democracy. And my role here as a journalist and as a filmmaker is, well, is dual. First and foremost, um, I'm going to share a little bit of my work with you. I'm going to share five minutes of my film, which will be premiering on Sunday at the BFI, a debate again with Jean Marcia and a couple of very prominent uh, British politicians. So, Number one, I'm going to talk about my work, but number two, I want to draw some very pertinent um, connections to the UK, which I think Jean and Marcia might struggle to do because they're not based in the UK. I have lived in the UK uh, my entire adult life. I am Brazilian born and I saw my country's democracy collapse or, or a near collapse if you if you like i i spent many years throughout the lula years hearing that brazil is becoming the country of the future i wasn't particularly politically active at those years because i didn't feel the urge came 2016 we saw a parliamentary coup when dilma was removed from office without any wrongdoing, which is a huge, 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 huge irony. A woman who is the epitome of integrity was removed from office on a technicality called fiscal peddling. So she was accused of being corrupt, when in reality, the reason why she was corrupt is because she did not tolerate corruption. And those who removed her were, were the most corrupt people. So Brazil has a long history of coup d'etats, and these coup d'etats have been consistently supported by the media. And when, anyway, when I say a long time, I go back to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, TV Global has played a central role in that. TV Global was the almighty television station in Brazil. And already in the beginning of the 20th century, when they were called the newspaper Anoichi, they were manipulating people. They were instilling hate and fear, something you're going to be in my film. When Getulio Vargas committed suicide in 1954, people demonstrated against the media. And why am I talking about all of this? Because these coup d'etats were... Uh, and, Getulio Vargas suicide in Brazil in 1954 was indeed uh, in many ways, 54, I hope I didn't get the year wrong, um, was indeed a coup d'etat. He, um, he was under pressure, he, would, he was about to commit suicide. He was, he would, there would be a coup d'etat had he not committed suicide. Then came 1964 and uh, all the mainstream media in Brazil supported the coup d'etat in 1964. TV Global very enthusiastically on the 1st of April 1964 released a headline saying democracy is reborn. We have been 
saved by the military. We have been rescued by the military and they call it divine providence with a capital D and a capital P. So they have been utilizing a, the religious themes in order to justify their lies. And what was the lie at that time? It's not very different to what we're seeing right now. The lie was they're going to implement communism in Brazil. Uh, we're saving you from communism. In 2016, it wasn't entirely different from that. They painted a picture, the, the PT, that had been in power for 13 years, which was a center-left government, which even implemented a lot of uh, neoliberal, a lot of neoliberal ideas into their program. They were forcibly removed. And two years later, they imprisoned Lula in a lawfare campaign. And what's lawfare? Lawfare is a portmanteau. It's a mixture of two words. It's warfare. And you replace the guns. Well, I'm talking about warfare, this, yeah, this. <laughs> well, they replace, you replace guns with the law. And what the media did, they orchestrated a very, 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 very careful campaign, a uh, campaign of lies or a campaign of manipulation, very Goebbels like, you would always see Lula and the word corruption in the same sentence. And when you see that a hundred times, you believe that Lula is corrupt. So I'm going to play five minutes from my film and I'm going to spend. Um, expand a little bit after that. A Globo é um fake news. E ela tenta impor ao Brasil uma narrativa. Eles conseguiram a mobilização contra a Dilma trabalhando oh. sistematicamente a opinião pública num momento difícil. Se você quer falar mais? Se você quer falar mais? Tem que fazer isso aí. A Globo é um fake news e ela tenta impor ao Brasil uma narrativa. Eles conseguiram a mobilização contra a Dilma trabalhando sistematicamente a opinião pública num momento difícil do Brasil. Mas não foi o suficiente. Ela foi caçada sem motivo algum. Historiadores no futuro vão dar voltas ao cérebro para conseguir explicar por que foi caçada a Dilma. Tem um exemplo mais claro, por exemplo, da eleição de 2014, quando a revista Veja soltou uma capa, que depois se mostrou mentirosa, que era a Dilma Rousseff e o Lula, na capa, no dia da eleição, dizendo eles sabiam de tudo. Eles sabiam de tudo, era, seria sobre uh, roubo na Petrobras, uh, não sei o quê, coisa e tal. E se mostrou mentirosa. Se mostrou mentirosa. Então, a manipulação da mídia é uma coisa, no Brasil, é escandalosa. É escandalosa. Ai, como... Algunos aspectos que siempre es, trato es eh, la cuestión de los monocultivos. Los monocultivos de la soja, de, del maíz, de los pinos. Eh, y esos monocultivos, en los monocultivos no hay pájaros, no hay sapos, no hay mosquitos, los ancudos, ¿no? No hay, no hay vida. Porque... Eh, destruyen la biodiversidad. Al destruir esta biodiversidad, eh, no genera la vida, la renovación. Pero hay un monocultivo mucho más peligroso que todos, que es el monocultivo de las mentes. Ese monocultivo de las mentes tiene que ver también con los tóxicos de la propaganda. Y estos tóxicos de la propaganda só no meio de comunicação. Vocês assistem a televisão todo dia? Todos os dias. Que, que tipo de programas vocês gostam de assistir? Novela, jornal, filme, chicanísio. E futebol, né? Futebol, futebol, né? Principalmente futebol. Né? Fantástico. Vocês assistem mais o Globo do que qualquer outro programa? Só, é, é, só o Globo.
a gente pode é, sintetizar assim. A Lava Jato investiga. O que, que acontece? Vaza informação para a mídia. A mídia utiliza dessa informação para desmoralizar a política e, sobretudo, o PT, Lula e todas as direções do PT. Foi uma operação muito bem planejada, que se repercute na maneira como funciona. Qual é o mecanismo que funciona? Há uma investigação em curso contra determinada pessoa. Essa investigação, porque você está tratando com pessoas que têm presunção de inocência, deveria ser uma, uma investigação reservada, cuidadosa, que somente poderia vir a público uma vez que tivesse consolidado um certo padrão de provas ou indícios muito relevantes contra aquela pessoa que é investigada. Porque se você destrói uma reputação, sua reconstrução é impraticável no mundo moderno. O que fazia o Ministério Público? Vazava precipitadamente, antecipadamente, determinadas investigações que estavam em curso. Para de persona... Para Globo, para o Estadão, para a Folha, para o Globo, para o Correio Brasilense, para a Record, para o SBT, mas centralmente para a Globo. O principal organismo comunicacional da Lava Jato era a Globo. Vazava essa informação sobre um personagem político de destaque, associado sempre a um empresário também relevante, e a Globo podia carregar o Jornal Nacional exclusivamente com as notícias que vinham dos vazamentos do Ministério Público. Bom, eu quero falar com você... Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about the symbiotic relationship between the judiciary and the media. There's a certain judge, a former judge called Sergio Moro, who constantly leaked information about the car wash operation. Car wash operation was an operation which was intended to investigate corruption and the and the oil giant, Petrobras, but it did very quickly morph into something very different. It morphed into a lawfare campaign. It, has, it was later revealed that Moro had visited the United States, that he had been trained by the CIA, and that the United States, after the demise of the USSR, the, the United States replaced the, um, the enemy the communism, the fight a, against Russia through, um, through empowering the justice system in, in countries such as Brazil. Lula and Zilma were very naive in many ways. They empower the police forces and the judiciary, which came back to, uh, to bite them and the butt. So what happened? The justice system worked in tandem More than that, they became partners and associates of TV Global and the other channels. TV Global and the other channels, they structured their journalistic coverage like a soap opera. There was a new revelation, a new factoid every day that suggested that Lula and Dilma were corrupt and that the Workers' Party was a criminal organization. And it was these lies It was this biased coverage. It was this piece of fake news that culminated in the prison of Lula, which was taken to the United Nations. We have now had leaks from Sergio Moro, which revealed that the entire organization, that the entire process was entirely framed. And Lula has therefore been freed from prison. So the environment of fake news, which we currently inhabit, isn't fed exclusively through WhatsApp. The mainstream media play a crucial role in the demonization of the Workers' Party and more broadly, the demonization of politics as a whole. And that's why Bolsonaro got elected. The media intended to 
Should we let someone a little bit more digestible, more lightweight, alchemy, the, the, the far right, where they let the beast, the frothing beast out of the cage to devour the workers' party, but then they couldn't get the beast back in the cage. And we ended up with a monster such as Bolsonaro in power. So the fake news are not spread solely via, via WhatsApp, solely via word of mouth. Noam Chomsky once famously said that the, that the purpose of the media is not to inform people, it's to manipulate people. Um, and finally, I also wanted to say that this phenomenon is not confined to Brazil. There are parallels all over the world. And very sadly, Brazil is a tragic laboratory. Stephen Bannon certainly has invested um, large amounts of money to, to test the dissemination of, of lies, of fake news, which do literally spread like wildfire. And these people inserted inside a bubble because people have closed themselves in, inside a bubble. The democratization of information is very double-edged. We have access to information, but we also become selective and people get wrapped inside that bubble and they live in an alternative reality where Jean Willis is a, a pervert who sold his seat in Brazil to live in Europe. And Marcia Chibuti is also a pervert, obsessed with, with anuses, it, it, isn't, isn't it, Martin? <laughs> Martin and um, the latest one, um, well, Camila Pitanga, love, lovely Brazilian actress. Um, I, I once... I was once here on stage with her presenting her film about her father, Pitanga. She came out as a lesbian. The latest piece of fake news is that I uh, heard that from my mother. My mother thought, oh, is this true? That being a lesbian isn't enough. So they said that she was a marriage wrecker, that uh, she stole the wife of Lazaro Ramos and that they were in a relationship. Not that there's anything with being a lesbian and and starting a new relationship, but fake news intends to portray people who do not fit the norms or who are subversive in any way as perverts. Uh, in the UK, we have seen abundant examples of media manipulation. Brexit was a big lie. We all know about the buses. Um, We've seen a leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, being completely destroyed through smears. Just to be clear, I'm not a fan of Jeremy Corbyn. I have a, a lot of reservations about Jeremy Corbyn. However, these reservations I have do not prevent me from recognizing that he was absolutely hated by the media, the Guardian every day. In the same way, Brazil always had Lula and corruption in the same sentence. The Guardian had anti-Semitism and Corbyn in the same sentence, despite the fact that Jeremy Corbyn has never said, has never made an anti-Semitic statement uh, in his life. Um, more broadly, we can talk about Russia as well. And um, well, Russia is a totalitarian state, so don't take me wrong. I do, I'm not applauding Putin, but we are, our media has entirely romanticized the conflict in, in the Ukraine. And uh, we are in a profoundly Russophobic society. We have learned to love Russia. In 2017, the BBC had a documentary uh, a hundred years of the revolution. In the very first sentence, in, in the opening in the, of the documentary was, was the revolution a coup? Well, the Russian revolution is the opposite of a coup. It was as grassroots as you can imagine, but uh, the media in this country have whole heart, will wholeheartedly embrace anything that Russia does to paint them as enemies, while very conveniently omitting what our very government does. Partygate is pretty much um, dead in the water. And people like uh, Donald Trump and, uh, and Boris have become immune to, to any sort of criticism um, because their, their supporters have 
become hypnotized and they literally live in a bubble where they filter all the information which they receive. So yes, we are talking about Brazil, but uh, I would like you to watch my film and to remember that these lessons can be transposed onto other countries. Uh, there are similarities, there, there are differences. However, the mainstream media tend to be controlled by millionaires and tend to attend the interests of the establishment. You do have some independent newspapers. Uh, the Guardian is not one of them. I worked for The Guardian myself for seven years. Guardian is a, is, a, is a newspaper that embraced the Iraq war, which was a war constructed upon one big lie called weapon of mass destructions. The Guardian likewise destroyed Jeremy Corbyn. So don't think that being in the UK, we are immune to fake news. Perhaps we're a little bit more immune to lawfare. The justice system is a little bit more mature and lawfare is very dangerous because um, once you, you set the precedent, you can, uh, it, it can, snowball and it can have terrible persecutions so lawfare is more is generally used in periphery, peripheral countries such as brazil and latin america and in this country we tend to use more sophisticated fake news and manipulation tactics however the bias is everywhere and uh, please keep your eyes open whether you're in brazil in the uk in the united states whether you're watching Global, whether you're watching Rupert Murdoch or Russia Today. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi, dear friends and colleagues. I'd like to thank everybody, especially the organizer, the organizers, Arthur, Vitor, also Jean and Priscilla, and you there with us. I will divide my brief statement in two parts. First, I will raise aspects about my case that I consider important for understanding the whole of our, our experience on fake news. I will say, having in mind dialectical basis of analysis that can help us, this means that it's necessary to pay attention to the nexus between the microphysics and the macrophysics of the power games under that we are oppressed now. We need to do that if we intend to overcome the social, historical, and political dark moment. I think we need to try to know what is personal, personal and uh, what is collective in the fascistization of uh, democracies. In a second moment, I will pose some uh, theoretical questions that I think are essential to promote the practical overcoming of fascism. About me, I'm not going to present you the timeline of my personal tragedy as an exiled, exiled person. I only want to say that I published four books on fascism in Brazil. The first of them, which was called How to Talk to a Fascist, was the first book to denounce the presence uh, of uh, fascism there when nobody, nobody accepted that it was happening. That book was published in, in uh, 2015 in Brazil. Because my book, I was accused of exaggeration by many people. That uh, ac accusation was against me, but also against Jean Willis, invited by me to write the preface, 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 preface 
<laughs> to, to that work in that time. It is important to say before everything that uh, what I say about me as an example happens with Jean and a lot of people that are in the process of resistance and confrontation against fascism. The extreme right began to hate me then. However, a programmatic and orchestrated persecution began uh, in 2017, the pre-election year in which I launched a book on grotesque, grotesque speech as political technology. Uh, the book, uh, The Psychocultural Underpinnings of Everyday Fascism, Dialogue as Resistance, that is published in English just now, brings all the main thesis on fascism that I have been developing over the years. So I am a philosophy professor and a writer exiled from Brazil since 2018 and currently teaching at a French university. Uh, since that year, uh, 2018, I've been persecuted and threatened with death. Now I can say about me that I am a researcher, but also a witness and a victim of the process ongoing in Brazil since the coup d'etat in uh, 2016. Throughout uh, these, these years, I've been alert about the waves of fake news. I realized that these waves intensify during election times as in the year 2020. Since October last year, I suffered a new wave of attacks on me. At, uh, at first, I was just perplexed, believing that it could be a lack of subject matter of the part uh, uh, by the fascists. Then I realized that there was a pragmatic intention. Uh, who were the fascists I am referring to? For example, far-right politicians like President Jair Bolsonaro, uh, uh, President Jair Bolsonaro's sons, and the president himself. You can imagine what is this? Me, I am only a professor of philosophy. You can, can you imagine what is when Bolsonaro speaks about me? It's absolutely crazy. Then, uh, except, except uh, from an interview I gave in 2015, uh, 15, uh, were broadcast and used from uh, in the year of uh, 2018, and uh, are relayed to this day uh, on the one day uh, on the president's Instagram account, but also on his son's Instagram and Twitter. This always happens when they need to distract the attention of the population. But this is very common nowadays. Uh, for example, uh, in, uh, there, there is, I think, uh, two, two weeks ago, Damaris Alves uh, speaks about me too and who I am. I am only a professor of philosophy. I am a feminist, uh, of course, but I'm only uh, 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 a regular people, <laughs> one person's uh, a little, uh, uh, a little uh, anti-fascist, I think. <laughs> but uh, what is the interest? Uh, however, uh, the fascists who in Brazil are also murderers will say that I cannot complain. Uh, I cannot protest because unlike uh, Marielle Franco, I am alive. Marielle was a militant very closer to me and Jean and her assassination, her murder by extermination groups linked to Jair Bolsonaro and his sons leaves no doubt of what can happen to people who oppose or denounce the mafias of Brazil, of uh, Brazilian politics. Back to the topic myself, I realized that since October 20, uh, 2021, 
several politicians have started to use me for political campaigning. This year, 2022, there will be presidential and congressional, congressional elections in Brazil. I began to understand the new wave of attacks when I, say, I saw my image circulation in the networks of candidates and pre-candidates. The extreme right was already begun to intensify the climate of aggression, and I realized that they would not leave me alone yesterday, now, uh, today, and yesterday, uh, as they do not leave me an, uh, alone today. This atmosphere of hate, this is the question, this atmosphere of hate that needs to be restored every day, creates the conditions of possibility for this extreme right to be elected. In that scenario, I realized that I was being a kind of image used by anyone for the purpose of inciting the digital mob. I mean, my image and my name were turned into a kind of token that is a kind of password. That password my name, my image, allows anyone to create a post, a, 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 post a post in Twitter, in Instagram, that generates engagement on social media. Evidently, uh, the, the social networks are the main mechanisms for reproduce, reproducing fascist propaganda that at this at this stage of fascism in Brazil is only subliminal because the state uh, has not, the government has not yet declared itself uh, fascist or Nazi fascist, although there are several signs of rising in this direction. On top of that, video posters and cards containing distortions are also numerically monet monetized. This means that anyone who engages in this kind of campaign can make money using images of people like me. You will ask me about image, image rights. There is nothing to do. I have consulted several lawyers and there is very little uh, I can do. Uh, in fact, my image has been usurped, usurped by the far right, like a head that has a sale value. So we can say that fascism among us is an ideology and a political technology, but is also a question of the market. That said, I move. Oh, sorry, that said, I move on to some uh, more theoretical placements, but uh, I think the question very important uh, there, uh, we need to remember that uh, uh, we have nowadays a, a, a fascism of market or a fascism uh, as market. To analyze fascism today implies understanding its differences with the fascism of the past. The difference is especially one of intensity. The, the technologies that run through history have changed. The conditions of possibility for the establishment of fascism have changed. Before, there was radio and cinema to help cultural industry. Since the 50s, uh, after Hitler's defeat, we have television and in the last decades, the internet. That is today we live in a digital public sphere. Uh, fascism has always been a movement of manipulated masses, but today the masses are also digital masses. Now the fascism is virtual to set uh, fascism in motion, it is necessary to put an end to questioning. That is, uh, it is necessary to remove critical thinking for, from circulation because this thinking does not allow the lies to advance. That is why I return, I would like to say uh, with Adorno, that critical thinking is the great enemy of fascism. Then, to be a professor of philosophy, 
means to be uh, means to destabilize the fascist system that lives on lies. So it's uh, it's fundamental for the system to destroy philosoph philosophy teachers as well as teachers of sociology, arts, and humanities in general, in order to destroy critical thinking. The cultural war is on the top in Brazil since a long time, and psychopower, it is uh, like a method, is uh, uh, it's the core of this, the core and the spirit of this, uh, um, this cultural war uh, that, that works with psychopower. Then the demand for through as a threshold needs to be destroyed in the system of manage and organize the line that is fascism. Um, I'd like to say that uh, fake news and fascism are, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, think uh, uh, something of uh, that that uh, construct uh, are construct in the in the same. Uh, in the same system. Then fascism aims, to, aims at the production of subjectivity. And that means that fascism creates the subjectivity it needs. To create that subjectivity, a machine is started up. I refer about this, this something uh, like psycho power. In analytical ther terms, what I define it as psychopower uh, or psychopower is the calculation that power makes about what people think, feel, and desire about the subjective space that leads them to act according to the needs of the system. I refer to the capitalist system organized on disinformation that seeks to replace critical thinking and the old parody, paradigm of truth. Uh, in very simple term, terms, this means how the government and the, the articulated powers of capitalism organizes brainwashing in a, in, a, in a perverse manner. It is a kind of mental emptying produced by the mechanisms of conceptual leaching. The subject of uh, autonomous thought is deflected. Uh, there is an emptying of a mentality, of a sensitivity, and of action, which aims at making human beings mere consumer, consumers, people reduced to robots of uh, capitalism. The perversion of the, this, this system, the capitalism, is complete. Uh, in simple terms, fascism becomes only an extremist expression of capitalism as a system of the devouring uh, of uh, human being and, of course, of nature. Uh, subjectivity is created in games of intersubjectivity, through which the system puts into the hands of the victims, in the hands, into the hands of the victims themselves, the possibility of becoming executioners. Uh, in very concrete terms, what I have called psychopower are experiments made with language with a view to, to a specific end of winning ele elections and the reaching political power. Today, we can speak of uh, uh, a true consumerism of language that is organized around the cliches and the repetitions that aim to establish the kingdom of lies, the real of lies. Social networks develop the system that we can call virtual fascism. It's much stronger and more intense than the fascism of the first half of the 20th, 20th century. Who is Bolsonaro in this context? What explains the phenomenon Bolsonaro? 
he's kind of a scarecrow of the plantation called Brazil. He is the demagogue, the populist, and the hip, hip, hypnotist, hypnotist, hypnotist. We need to remember that Brazil and Latin America are chosen to be an eternal colony of imperialism and colonizing states at the service of capitalism. Bolsonaro has only one function in this government to be the, uh, he is the puppet that calls people's attention every day with his grotesque speeches and acts. As an authoritarian leader, he is the main operator of the masses manipulation. Paulo Guedes, the corrupt economy minister and his partners, the super rich is in Brazil, is the real boss in the operation of the destruction of our country. My work has been to show how this fascist operation works. Um, uh, this operation uh, works in language. My desire is to collaborate towards a culture of dialogue and free thought. And for this, we need analysis and uh, we need analysis and the criticism, art and science, education, and a philosophy that can be in the lives of people attacked by the system of uh, media brainwashing. Thank you very much. I will go, yeah. With my question. All right, guys. First of all, thank you for having me. I probably won't need the microphone because my voice is naturally very loud. Maybe because I work in an ambulance and the sirens are so loud and I'm a little bit deaf now. Um, I was invited and it's a true honor to speak to you guys today. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And you guys are amazing. And I'm actually very nervous to speak after so uh, many amazing people and their stories. It's, it's humbling. Um, before I even start, is anyone here that does not speak English? Everyone cool with English? Great. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Where's your colleague? And, and, yeah, my colleague is in the other room. And, uh, oh, in the other room. Yeah, my voice is not that good. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. I'll try not to. Um, if I start screaming, like, just let me know. Um. <laughs> Okie dokie. So my name is Priscilla Curry. I am, as you can see, a paramedic. That's me. Very happy in my uniform. That was before the pandemic, mind you. I don't think I smile as much now. Um, and you see the little dinosaurs there on top of Brazil and British. And basically, I'm half Scottish, half Brazilian. I know it's a very strange mix. My father went to Brazil and just never came back. So he met my mother there. Um, but I brought in, you know, I got the British blood back to where it belongs. So I live here since I'm 20 years. So I'm almost 20 years here. So pretty much half of my life here. I graduated from St. George's University in 2014, and I do work for the NHS as a senior fast response paramedic. And I work in my own vehicle. I don't know if you heard the little single responder vehicles that you see all the time, deafening people. That's me. We only go to the worst and most time critical um, patients. So in the pandemic, I was swept off my feet and I've never imagined that I was gonna work in something like this. 
So what happened at the beginning of the pandemic, I did a video trying to explain to people what COVID was and what to expect, not what to expect. Mind you, I had no idea <laughs> that when I was doing that video, first day was gonna go viral. Um, I did a video because I was very annoyed that during my break, I do work 12 hours. And to be honest, we don't get breaks. We have to pretend to be going to the toilet if you wanna have a sandwich. So I said to them, okay, I, I, I'm gonna use facilities. I went to Asda. And in Asda, there was no bread, there was no flour, there was nothing in Asda. You know, I was thinking, Jesus. And we all kind of heard that there was something coming, but we we're not really sure what it was. China was being very secretive. Italy was falling apart. And the UK was just going, oh, let's see what's going to happen. So we were in that stage. And um, I went to Asda and things were just nothing on the shelf, people panicking. And I went to Asda to buy literally a sandwich and a bottle of water, I swear to you. Once I got into Asda and there were so many people just buying stuff. And when I went through the aisle of toilet paper, there was no toilet paper. And mind you, I don't need toilet paper. I am in my ambulance and there's loads of toilet paper at home. But I have this urge to buy toilet paper, right? So I'm thinking, what is going on? Why do I need to buy? And then I wanted to buy flour. I don't even bake. So I got pulled into that hysteria, the chaotic hysteria that people have. And I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, this is, this is what mass hysteria feels like. You know, personally rational, kind of almost normal person going shopping. And I felt myself the impulse of wanting to buy. Um, so I left. I did not buy the toilet paper because there was none. And I didn't have flour either. But I did have my sandwich and my bottle of drink. Went back into my ambulance and I'm just sat there going, Jesus, what the hell is going on? I went then to the OMS um, website, as you guys must know, the World Health Organization. And I decided to read about COVID and I wanted to see what is going on. And what do these people know that I don't know? You know, should I panic? Should I start stock buying? And I did a video that lasted about eight minutes. I was very emotive in my video. It was literally for the 100 people, 200 people that followed me because I teach first aid to the general public. So I have a page talking about that. So I have, you know, people asking me privately, can you talk about this? Can you talk about that? And I wasn't very keen. But anyway, I went on the OMS website, had a look, and I was like, okay, let's put this into context. So I did a video and saying, please stop buying toilet paper and the flowers in the supermarkets because this isn't helping anybody. Um, as you can see here, we have the risk group and these are the people uh, that will mostly be affected and this is still true today. And I kind of basically made it into very simple lame words that people could understand what COVID was at that time. We're going back now, March, 2019. This video guys had 20 million views. So I'd done this video while I was at work. So put, you know, put my phone in my pocket and I'm treating my patient. And I normally put my phone here and it was vibrating so much that I was thinking, oh, what's going on here? You know, and afterwards, my phone was almost running out of battery. My sister, I have like 19 missed calls from my sister. This is basically three hours after I'd done the video saying, what did you do? I have your video in every single WhatsApp family group and people just go <laughs> mental. And I'm like, oh my God. So I finished work and I went home and I was just thinking, oh my God, what did I just do? Did I do something wrong? You know, and you know, there was lots of people loving the video and thanking me for helping them to understand what the COVID was about. Even though I didn't even know myself, I literally, I swear to, to, my, to my dog, this is, you know, like my son, I swear on his life that I literally went to the World Health Organization and I translated letter to letter what he said that. It was never my idea of COVID. It was what I read at the time. So I went home and I have all these messages and my business phone number, which is on my um, Facebook page. I didn't have Instagram then. It was just crazy. I had like 500 messages there on my WhatsApp. It was crazy. And I was like, oh my God, now I need to do a video to explain to people what I said because the eight minutes video is not enough. So I done the video. And from then on, this logo kind of was born. And you must be wondering why the dinosaurs. Well, I had loads of people that liked the video and had loads of people that started following me. But I also had hate. I was hated. 
I was swear that uh, people wanted me to die. Um, they hated me because I'm fat, because I'm gay, because I'm a woman, because I have short hair, because my teeth is crooked. Well, it's not anymore because I have braces now. But, you know, any reason that they could find to hate me, they would. So the attack started. And thanks to my mother, who is a psychologist, my father is a doctor, so it kind of give me a nice little balance there. And my actual further studying, I have some postgrad in psychology and human behavior. I am fascinated about human behavior. And seeing the behavior towards me, I never took personal. I knew it wasn't personal. It's the people's own frustration that they were, you know, they were confused about who they are in the world and they attacked others. And this is how it is. So I never took it personally. So I did, I called them dinosaurs. So every time I do a video, I go and say, Fala galerinha, fala dinossauros. It's basically me saying, hello guys, hello dinosaurs. I never delete my haters, never. They always welcome me on my page. They can do what they want. So as I've never deleted them, I always allow them to stay. Obviously the engagement carried on because you need to get the positive out of the bad. So all the dinosaurs that hated me and created fake news, um, they edited my videos, putting things that I've never said. And you know the story goes on from there. So I find myself in a very interesting um, experiment. And I had a choice to be made. Like, do I just completely go back to my ambulance and carry on my work, which I love? Or do I just embrace this and just carry on? So I decided to embrace it because my curiosity for human behavior, uh, it's infinite as much as my passion to saving lives. Um, with this part, half, two, two and a half years, I developed a campaign and it's called hashtag the Hubi as fake news. And it basically says, please let's not destroy fake news. And as you can see the logo in my shirt, I have a dinosaur and we are literally killing it. Can you see? I don't know if you guys can see. So dinosaurs represent the critics, the people that spread fake news, the annoying family member that we all have. That it doesn't matter all the things you do right, they only see the things that you do wrong. So these are the dinosaurs in our life and we all have them. Oh, why is this not working? I just need to press it. Okay, cool. I just use the mouse. Okay, cool. So my personal journey for discovering what fake news mean, and it actually blowed my mind. In 2012, while I was studying my degree to be a paramedic, so it's a, but it's a paramedic, is a science degree. So in that case, we get exposed to a lot of science paper and we have to judge the quality of papers. I was given a paper to read and it just literally, I swear to God, it changed my way of, of seeing life. I do warn you though, there's picture evidence of my reactions as shown through the presentation or you can call it a creative emoji. Uh, yeah. In 1998, Andrew Wakefield and 12 of his colleagues published in The Lancet I don't know if you know, guys know The Lancet. The Lancet is one of the most respected medical and science journals into today. A study that suggested that measles, mumps, and rubella MMR vaccine may predispose children to develop autism. Now, this is in 2012, I'm reading this, and I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong, but I'm reading this in an article that was published in The Lancet for crying out loud. I mean, wow. So then I started to doubt myself. I was like, oh my God, is this real? Could this, any of this be real? Well, in 2010, 12 years later, 12 years later, this article was published and available for people to read for 12 years. Lancet completely retracted the Wakefield paper. Wakefield and his team were found guilty of fraud and all of it for financial gain. So you can imagine this, like how many families until today believe the vaccinations actually causes autism when it's merely because the children in the study, mind you, they picked 12 children. Well, in all due respect, a research that's done in 12 people do not, should not have the merit that this paper received, especially when this study wasn't blinded. It was chosen, there was no peer review, 
it was just done in the most silly way. I mean, if that study would never today, thanks God, it would have never been published in the Lancet. But it was. They lost a lot and they were, um, they were found guilty of fraud because someone that was against the vaccines at the time had a better offer of vaccination. So the big pharma paid them out to do this so they could then introduce the other vaccine or the other medication that was more important. But we're not here to talk about this. I'm just showing you how things can happen. Um, I already said that's my face because every time I say the story inside, that's how I'm, that's how I'm in. Um, so we know 2019, 2020, 21, 22, we are at the current time. The first online and social media era, the pandemic is happening. Now, I don't know if you know a little bit of pandemic history, but every 100 years, we have a pandemic. Okay, so this is part of nature. We are animals at the end of the day. We live in nature and this will happen, especially that we are more and more invading animals' habitats, so animals will come and diseases will spread. The perfect storm for fake news, because now we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have WhatsApp, we have all these things that we didn't have back in the day. So it's so easy now to spread misinformation. So the pandemic, which is a perfect storm for a horrible pandemic of fake news that have killed more people than COVID itself. And this will all come to light in the future because we can only connect the dots looking backwards. So while we're in the middle of the storm, we can see it, but in the future, in history, in college, in universities, this will be studied. Now I have an interesting one for you. In 2016, study by a computer scientist at Columbia University finds that internet trends may have shifted from clickbaiting to sharebaiting where users are more interested in sharing content than actually reading it. Now, let's be honest here. You guys, everyone here has social media, yeah? Everyone here has Instagram, yeah? Okay, okay, now, uh, now let's be honest here. Have anyone here ever shared something that they haven't fully read? Is anyone here guilty of it? You go, I'm, I'm guilty of that, I am, yeah, you, you, you do. You get so impressed by the title. You just you go, oh my God, I need to share this. And you share it without reading it. So there you go. 2016, they create this. A sarcastic news site, Science Post, published an astonishing headline. And he said, 70% of Facebook users only read the headline of science stories before commenting. Guess what happened? Two weeks later, 40,000 people, 40,000 people share this. But there was a catch. Can anyone guess what the catch was? The catch was this news were fake. If you click on this, the first paragraph was in clear English. The remaining paragraphs were written in gibberish a language that no one in the world speaks. So people were sharing something that was fake, proving that the experiment by Columbus University proven right, right there and then. So everyone that shared this was part of a live scientific study. Isn't this incredible? And maybe even I shared it, I don't know, but it's so easy for this to happen. The worst shared fake news, and that's my face right now, but I'm gonna behave. Um, the worst shared news fakes in the past two years. Vaccines were rushed. Have you guys, I'm sure you guys all heard those ones. Vaccines were rushed. We are test subjects. Vaccines cause infertility. Vaccine will kill us. Vaccines will change our DNA. That was a very famous one in Brazil. I mean, I tied my tail really well, but I am a little bit of a dinosaur inside. Now, I'm just going to talk about the first one. Vaccines were rushed. Right. Never in the story of humanity, we have so much money being poured into finding the vaccine. Never. Never any medicine, any study. It just never happened. So with money, we have power. With power, we have technology. And if you look at your phones now, I'm guessing everybody has an iPhone here or a smartphone. 
if you go five years ago, your phones did not do what your phone does now. So you cannot compare technology from 70 years ago to a technology used today. We also had a record number of people volunteering to be the real guinea pigs on this. So it was a mass number of people worldwide. So if you put this all together with the record breaking people joining in from scientists to money to farmers, on, I am in, I'm not innocent here. I know that lots of money was being made, okay? So let's just not say that they're innocent completely. However, we needed vaccine to stop this and we got one and God, what a good vaccines we did get, despite the fake news involved in it. Today we're here with our masks talking because the vaccines does protect it to, to a level. I'm not gonna go into each of one of them, but just for you to see how damaging can be. The thing is, why do we believe in fake news though? And you could argue, oh, it's because uneducated people, maybe it's uncultured people. That's not true. Very educated people and intelligent people come forward to being fake news and spreaders. Science has no sides, has no religion, and no hidden agenda. Science does not always make sense, and it doesn't, not to mention all the jargon. Whilst fake news are smart, they make sense, and most of the time they're appealing. They will go in your psychology, in your brain. So this is how it works. If I say something very scientific here, using my scientific knowledge, people that don't understand science will fall asleep. This is boring. If I make this into lame terms, whoop, your ears go up. So if I start saying, saying something that's true, that you know is true, you recognize that in your heart and you go, okay, I feel comfortable about this, this is true. But if I lie, on the last thing that I say, you're not gonna know because you trust me now. I got your trust because I made you feel into the shoes that I'm, you kind of put yourself in the place of the things I'm saying. You trust me because the first three things I said was real. But if I carry on with a lie, you believe me. And this is how fake news is spread. They manipulate the truth and they will manipulate science. So, um, here's an example of my daily educational battle in my social media. So my social media evolved into helping people understand science and fake news and a bit of my life and the dinosaurs, psychology is a little bit of everything in my social media. And I recently posted something about monkeypox. So monkeypox, it's, um, there's more than 30 cases in London. It's, a, it's not a very serious disease, but let's face it, no one wants to get that. So I did a post educating people between the difference of chicken pox, monkey pox, and smallpox, which I'm not gonna go into detail now, but so I basically said that, which I get this comment. By the way, I wasn't talking about vaccines, okay? The comment is, of course, we now have monkey diseases in the UK. The COVID vaccine, AstraZeneca, developed in Oxford, used monkey adenovirus in its composition. Right, so, if anyone understands anything about vaccines here, you will recognize that this statement has some truth, right? It's true, okay? So, the, uh, the COVID vaccine, AstraZeneca, developed in Oxford, that's, that's true, yeah? You guys all know this. And it has indeed used adenovirus from primates. It has indeed used a monkey. But this technology of vaccinations is so old. It's so old, it's the most used. We use the monkeys because they are similar to us and they help us to fight diseases. So this technique is nothing new. But for this person in their mind and the lack of knowledge, because I don't think she's a bad person, the person that wrote this and isn't a horrible person. She's just very confused. She's scared of the unknown, we all are. When we don't understand something, you are scared of it. And if you're scared of it, you don't look at it. You avoid it and you don't like it. Once we get to know something, we're more likely to understand it. So the brain cannot accept the unknown. If you're asking a question here, something like, oh, is monkeypox gonna become a pandemic? And I'm gonna say to you, unlikely, but I don't know. You don't like the answer. It's uncomfortable. 
we like to know answers. So what the brain does, it will find an answer, even if the answer is a lie. So this person told herself a lie because she feels comfortable with this. Do you, do you see what I mean? Isn't that she's a stupid person, she just doesn't understand about science. Now, when I read this comment, it made me laugh. I find it funny because this is so ridiculous that it's funny to me. But from my background, it's funny. If I go to speak to my friends that are not medically or scientific related, they actually look at this and they go, oh, could it be true? They will they'll start believing this. And this is how fake news begin. Lack of knowledge, the fear of the unknown, people create stuff and it just, it booms. Not to forget about uh, hidden interests and agendas behind fake news. So every time you get given a study or through WhatsApp or whatever, for instance, let me give you an example. Paracetamol is a drug that everyone is, it's important. No, every GP in this country loves paracetamol. So let's talk, let's talk about paracetamol. If a study say that paracetamol is the best drug in the world that will treat everything, right? And you get that sent through WhatsApp. You click on the link and the name of the website is www.paracetamol dot call dot uk can you trust that information well no because paracetamol had funded that study hasn't it so if a study is funded by the people's interest so it's completely biased and this is what happened in brazil a lot with medications that were that were between brackets proven to work against covid but the people that did the research had 100% interest on the results. It was completely biased. So when it comes to science, you need to look behind the studies by learned in 1998 when that study that was pulled out is what is the personal interest of the person behind the study? Who funded that study? Because if the person that funded the study had an interest on the results, that's the study is pointless. So without further ado, because I talk a lot, um, <laughs> so um, Priscilla Paramedic Londres is my Portuguese website and my English website is yeforsaid.com. Um, so um, thank you so much for having me and I'm sorry if I talk a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much for all um, the panelists today, uh, Marcia, uh, Priscilla, Victor, and Jean. Let me just double check that Jean's still here. Let me um, stop sharing screen. Yes, hi, Jean. Hello. <laughs> you are here. Great. So I think we can open to a few questions. We don't have a lot of time. Um, but um, if anyone would like to ask any question here, I can bring in the microphone to you. And um, is anyone like to volunteer to ask a first question? Yes. Okay. We like difficult questions. Same difficult thing. questions. Okay. And then give me a hand. Hello. Uh, thank you to whoever to Victor for organizing this event, for the panelists. Well, we are four years after 2018, and what has been done in Brazil to stop fake news? Because all the groups that were active in 2018, the WhatsApp groups, they're still there. And what has been done? We have elections now, and those groups are still there. So how, you know, what can we do to stop fake news in Brazil, in the elections, and again, interfering with elections. Well, this is whoever wants to answer, if there is an answer. Bom, eu vou... Essa, essa é uma pergunta que dif, é, difícil de responder de maneira objetiva, porque a desinformação é hoje um problema mundial, né? um desafio para as democracias do mundo. É, não é só o Brasil que está enfrentando o problema das fake news, do, desse processo mais amplo de desinformação. 
outros países também, e, esse, e os países que estão enfrentando o problema da, da desinformação, estão, coincidentemente, com autocratas ou aspirantes a fascistas nos governos, com a extrema-direita empoderada. E também porque o processo de desinformação inclui, como a Priscila explicou brilhantemente, é, afeta outros aspectos da vida humana, como, por exemplo, a, a, a saúde pública ou, a, agora, a questão ambiental. Todo, todo, toda desinformação e mentiras em relação às mudanças climáticas, ou seja, a desnegação das mudanças climáticas decorrentes do aquecimento global. É, pouca coisa foi feita no Brasil. Primeiro porque as vítimas principais da... Da, do, do processo de desinformação das fake news no Brasil, as vítimas principais são a, as pessoas de esquerda, né? e são as pessoas de esquerda ou ativistas de direitos humanos, porque as pessoas de esquerda e ativistas de direitos humanos historicamente representam o, as pessoas que estão na base da pirâmide. Tá? Então, a, as fake news são um tipo de violência política perpetrados pelas pessoas que estão no topo da pirâmide e contra as pessoas que estão na base da pirâmide, seja atingindo elas diretamente, seja atingindo seus representantes, como eu, eu exemplifiquei tão bem no caso de Marielle Franco. Então, a esquerda ela ficou estupefata, é, chocada com esse processo, com a vitória de Bolsonaro, a vitória é, acachapante da extrema-direita sobre o campo de centro-esquerda e o, e, o, e o campo democrático. É... O país foi surpreendido, o país e o mundo foram surpreendidos por uma pandemia. Então, tentou-se organizar uma CPI das fake news no Brasil, que não deu certo. Não deu certo porque também é, a esquerda, ela, ela é, ou as pessoas de esquerda que estão no Congresso Nacional, é, não, não deram, ou, não, ou, não, ou, não, ou ainda não deram a devida importância a esse fenômeno. Então, indicaram. É, deputados e, de, e deputadas analógicos, desculpe o, o adjetivo, mas deputados e deputadas que nada sabiam do processo digital. Então, essas pessoas foram humilhadas pela extrema-direita nessa CPI é, que tentou fazer. Né? É, agora tem um esforço do, por parte do, TS, do, do TSE, do Tribunal Superior Eleitoral, e do TRE, ou do, e do é, TSE, Tribunal Superior Eleitoral, e o outro é o Supremo Tribunal Federal, o STF. Há um esforço por parte dessas duas instâncias do judiciário de conter, de alguma maneira, o processo de desinformação. Então, Alexandre de Moraes é, coordena, digamos assim, uma investigação da, do Supremo Tribunal Federal em relação aos, ao que eles estão chamando de ataques à democracia. E aí que envolve essa, esse ecossistema, essa economia de mentiras, e aí foi nessa, nessa, no rastro dessa investigação que o Alan dos Santos, que é um dos principais, era um dos principais é, atores, agentes dessa desinformação no Brasil, fascista, bolsonarista, teve que sair do país, né? ele, ele saiu é, fugido do país porque a, a prisão dele foi decretada, é, e ele então foi para os Estados Unidos, a conta dele foi deletada no, no YouTube, ele, ele, houve também o um movimento do Sleep Giant, que fez um processo de, de desmonetização dos, dos canais de, de desinformação. Nós tivemos a boa sorte, ainda que tardia, da morte de Olavo de Carvalho, que era a figura, é, o intelectual de extrema direita, que orientava, do ponto de vista intelectual, esses, essas figuras, esses influencers digitais. É, nunca, é, é, nunca é demais dizer que o Olavo de Carvalho é um mistificador, é, mentiroso, compulsivo, que fazia um melting point da filosofia ocidental sem nunca ter lido nenhum filósofo e escrevia para escrevia é, é, a medida para idiotas, né? para idiotas que querem se pensar inteligentes. Então, nós tivemos a sorte dele morrer, é, o que foi um baque nessa economia, e, e, e essas ações, as, as, aí, 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 claro, houve ações individuais, como a minha, por exemplo, os processos que eu movi geraram jurisprudência. É, o, o processo que eu movi contra Eder Mauro, que é um, 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 um deputado, que é um, um, um escumalho, assim, um rebotalho humano é, do Pará, ligado a que tem relações com grupos de extermínio, é, eu movi um processo contra ele e eu ganhei esse processo, no, foi julgado no STF e gerou uma jurisprudência de que, por exemplo, a, a imunidade parlamentar não cobre 
a, os crimes de calúnia, injúria e difamação. Ou seja, a partir dessa decisão, qualquer pessoa pode entrar com processos contra parlamentares por calúnia, injúria e difamação. Então, aí eu venci um processo contra Bibo Nunes, também, que é, o, é um, um senador bolsonarista. Ou seja, essas ações individuais minhas, da Márcia, da Manuela Dávila, do Caetano Veloso, ou seja, os processos no âmbito da justiça estão traçando algumas linhas de contenção. Mas é um fenômeno difícil de tratar como uma própria pandemia. É, a gente precisa... A gente venceu a pandemia, ou pelo menos achamos que vencemos, é, e eu creio que também a gente vai vencer a infodemia, que é a pandemia de desinformação. É, eu acho que a gente vai conseguir conter isso, isso envolve, vai envolver também uma certa educação digital, ou seja, uma alfabetização digital. Os processos de alfabetização agora não podem ser separados do processo de alfabetização digital. Não tem, não tem o tempo de que a gente vai alfabetizar as, as crianças e depois explicá-las como lidar com o mundo digital. Não, agora a coisa tem que ser simultaneamente. Inclusão é, digital desde já. A educação, por isso a educação é um terreno importantíssimo, porque ela tem que preparar as pessoas para esse mundo, para essa second life, na qual cada vez mais estamos presentes ou estão está cada vez mais presentes mais presente em nossas vidas. E, portanto, essa educação vai, digamos digamos que, preparar as subjetividades para distinção entre o que é falso, o que é verdadeiro, ou pelo menos para a dúvida né? é, sobre esses conteúdos. Ok. I'd like to say something to that as well. I think uh, the solution... Can you hear me? Okay. Ok. Is do... I think this, yeah, this one's a little bit better. Yeah, my voice was a little robotic. No? Okay, I'll try this one then. Uh, well, I think there's two ways. I think the effort is dual. First, we have to fight against fake news on an individual level. And the left wing is as guilty as the right wing. I've seen people in the left wing spread fake news all the time. And when I pointed it out, they said, well, but it's well intentioned. Well, that doesn't justify it. So we as individuals, we must check our sources. We must not emulate, we must not use the same practices as the far right. And I have seen the left wing do that. So number one, it starts at home. Always check your sources. Always go as deep as you can in order to establish whether the information is true or not. Not just read a piece of news from an obscure outlet and share it because you're outraged because there's a strong likelihood that that's going to be fake. So that's number one. We have to change it at a personal level. Uh, number two, from, from a legal perspective, and that's a little bit trickier because there's a very thin line between um, balance, truth, and censorship. And if we have a malignant government such as Bolsonaro in control of fake news, that's going to backfire. So media bias and fake news are, are a very, 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 very contentious ground. I have mixed views. I'm not entirely sure how much we can legislate on fake news i'm not saying we should uh, we should be free to to spread fake news um however we um yeah if we see um a truly authoritarian government as and there are many in the world where um, they will disseminate information as they like so so i think it's a combination of a personal effort and um and government initiatives, um, but we have to be careful not to slip into censorship in the hands of uh, a malignant government. Can I, I just want to say something very quickly about fake news too. Um, it, one of the reasons why fake news spreads so much, it's that people, um, uh, 
people are more committed with feelings than with rationality, apparently, many times. So they're more committed to their prejudices, uh, to what they want to think, and they want people to spread what they think, regardless whether this is uh, rational or not. Um, there, there is a really interesting book that I, it, it clarified a lot my views of um, uh, why uh, sometimes uh, it's, um, uh, particularly in the last few years with the internet, how why fake news, for example, spread so quickly and why particularly the, the, the right or the far right benefits so much from that. Um, so the book is from Jonathan Haidt. Uh, it's called The Righteous Mind. And I, I, I really liked one of the metaphors that he uses in the book, that's the elephant and the rider. You, some of you should have heard about this metaphor before. It's basically that he says that... Pardon? Sorry? No, it's just a... Um, he so it's the elephant, the, ride, the rider, is that, as in that... the. We, the rider of the elephant thinks that he or she is is is, is directing where the elephant must go, um, but actually it's the elephant who is determining where the, it should go. And the elephant represents the feelings, and the rider that represents the rationality just thinks or uh, that um, he is conducting the journey, but actually he or she is is actually just just fine what the feelings wants to do. So that's uh, why sometimes people share, um, you know, uh, memes, for instance, on the internet without thinking much about the consequences of them. It's just because it's fulfilling their desires. That's what I think is so difficult to tackle it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I have a problem with this operator how, because the problem is uh, fake news is a problem, but uh, we need a, another problem that is that people don't understand what is fake news. And then um, uh, we need to to study this and then uh, maybe have a solution, have a, um, have, a, have a way, have a project to to fight to fake news, and we can we can use the government. If uh, if I if I will have a government uh, in in the future and a government uh, in favor to us, uh, because now we have a government by fake news, uh, made by fake news, and then uh, I think uh, we can we can construct, for example, uh, collectives. Um, in, in the society, in our, in our uh, communities, uh, with our colleagues and uh, friends. Uh, but uh, in the future, if I will have uh, uh, government, if, if I will have our country, uh, maybe we can uh, have the uh, Ministry uh, of uh, Education and the Culture and the uh, uh, the, I think a, a project, it's absolutely necessary approach, project very, very hard to combat it. But um, the, the, the question of how is not so, so easy to, to uh, understand because we don't understand the matter. We don't understand, uh, and people are uh, if, uh, absolutely... Uh, in living with fake news as uh, like a, a, nor, a, norm, a normal thing. One of the problems we, we've got <coughs> as well, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation because the right wing are accusing us of spreading fake news. They say they're victims of fake news as well, just much as we are. And well, we know that's not true. But they, they subvert the argument in their favor. And Donald Trump all the time is saying all the time he's a victim of fake news. So how do we how do we turn turn things around? Spreading fake news in 2018 are still there. So they haven't been dismantled. So there's no way of reporting these groups. So they say, oh, you can report a WhatsApp group 
you report some fake news in a WhatsApp group, but nothing happens. So, you know, since 2018, there's been promises that there would be measures by the TSC uh, and the STF, but we haven't actually, effectively, we haven't actually seen anything being done because the same groups are still there operating WhatsApp, sharing only fake news. I know because I'm infiltrated in some of those groups. And now they're also in other social medias in Telegram and Signal, but it's the same groups have been there for four years. And what, you know, what can we do about that? You know, what has been done about that? Because they, and it's the same fake news that attacked all of you John Willis, Master Shibori, Evergenese, you know, and, and, and they're going to be there again, you know, replicating the same fake news. Nothing's been done about it, apparently. So I know this is a difficult question. Isn't it? Porque não é sim. É porque não é simples de responder. Eu sei que dá uma sensação enorme de impotência e a gente tem às vezes essas fantasias. Eu também tenho essas fantasias de que a gente pode solucionar tudo de uma maneira mágica, mas não vai solucionar. Não é dessa maneira. Muita coisa foi feita. Eu elenquei aqui uma série de coisas que foram feitas. Só que o processo de desinformação é como uma epidemia. É difícil de conter. Se espalha. Envolve uma uma dimensão do da, da psique humana, que é que são, que são os sentimentos. Justo é isso, a, essa metáfora aí que foi utilizada do elefante, ou seja, que, que é uma coisa que Freud já tinha dito lá no século XIX, quando Freud vai tratar do inconsciente, a gente é movido por uma força inconsciente. A nossa consciência é uma vela acesa dentro de uma enorme casa que a gente não, não tem ideia. Nós somos feitos desses preconceitos. As, as fake news interpelam preconceitos que estão nas pessoas, produzem identificações monstruosas, é, de, é, permitem o, o, o desenvolvimento de uma estrutura maléfica, maligna de pensamento em pessoas que a gente julgava boas. E isso acontece porque as pessoas renunciam à capacidade de pensar, renunciam a, a essa, a, a, também esse fundamento mesmo singular do ser humano, que é a capacidade de pensar, de se, de, 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 de se perguntar, de se interrogar se isso que você está fazendo é bom ou não é. Entendeu? É, as, as, as fake news a, e a, a extrema-direita levam vantagem nisso, porque a extrema-direita não tem nenhuma intenção em, em libertar as pessoas, o espírito das pessoas, em libertar a consciência das pessoas, em torná-la a extrema-direita ao contrário. Ela, ela é reacionária a transformações do mundo. Né? Daí a, a, o termo reacionário ela é conservadora, ela quer conservar status quo, o status quo, o establishment, né? ela quer conservar privilégios, ela não quer... Então, é, é difícil, não é uma pergunta fácil de responder, não vai ter só, é, é, resposta fácil. Tem muita coisa sendo feita, mas tem, eu, eu poderia dizer que isso é menos do que deve, já deveria ter sido feito, porque é, há muitos interesses em jogo, houve um momento em que a, a, a classe dominante brasileira, é, na sua diversidade, entre aspas, é, se uniu ao banditismo né, mais explícito, às máfias, e perpetraram o golpe de 2016. Depois, essas forças políticas pactuaram novamente para eleger Bolsonaro. E elegeram Bolsonaro. E, e daí nasceu um monstro de três cabeças, um governo que era liderado por Paulo Guedes, ou seja, essa, representa esse, ultra, né, esse ultraliberalismo, esse neoliberalismo predatório, é, que Márcia Tiburi descreveu muito bem na fala dela, o Sérgio Moro, que representa a lei, que representava a lei e a ordem, ordem, portanto, esse discurso, é, o discurso da corrupção, esse, utilizado ali como um, 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 uma fachada para tornar o Estado mais bélico, mais penal, né? fortalecer o Estado penal e, portanto, lógico, a criminalização dos pobres, dos movimentos sociais, e a, e a cabeça é, mais espalhafatosa ideológica, entre aspas, que era o Bolsonaro, que representava o fascismo mais explícito. Então, esse governo, é, 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 as fake news e os grupos e todo o ecossistema demorou de ser combatido porque beneficiava as classes dominantes brasileiras, beneficiava os donos de jornais, 
de jornais e telejornais, que tem todo o interesse na, no desmonte do, do estado do bem-estar social, das leis trabalhistas. O interessava os aplicativos, como, por exemplo, esses Uber e todos esses de, de entrega delivery, que não dá nenhum, nenhum direito trabalhista às pessoas, né? estão escravizando elas. Interessava o agronegócio, interessava ao crime organizado, ou seja, ao tráfico de armas, ao tráfico humano, à exploração sexual de mulheres. Ou seja, por isso nada, dá a impressão de que nada foi feito. Porque, claro, é, é, o ecossistema de mentira ele foi, ele beneficiou durante muito tempo todas essas figuras, todos esses setores da política e da sociedade que se beneficiaram e perpetraram o golpe, se beneficiaram dele. Então, a coisa... Não, é, a gente está falando... O buraco é muito mais embaixo, não é tão simples. Né? Marielle não está morta por acaso. Né? Lula não ficou preso mais de um ano por acaso. Eu não estou no exílio. Massa Tipuri, Débora Diniz, Anderson França... Nós não estamos no exílio por acaso. Tudo isso é parte de um mesmo fenômeno. A ascensão da extrema-direita. Então, não... E, e, claro, a extrema-direita tem seus braços nos poderes da República, no judiciário, no legislativo. Eu nem vou falar, porque, por exemplo, isso que a imprensa insiste em chamar de centrão é, é uma mistificação. Essa é a primeira mistificação, uma fake news. A ideia de que aquele, aquelas, aqueles oligarcas fisiologistas, aqueles ladrões do erário público, constituem um centro democrático. Não constituem, eles são à direita eles são os velhos partidos de direita, chamados de centrão pela imprensa. Ou seja, o braço do banditismo está ali, dentro desse, desses setores. Né? As oligarquias sempre perpetraram crime no, no Brasil. Crimes, não só crimes contra o erário público, mas crimes mesmo de matança, né? como o Eldorado dos Carajás. É, é isso, não é, uma, não é simples. Eu sei que vocês gostariam de uma uma resposta simples de nossa parte, mas nós estamos num papel mais de entendimento nesse momento, né? de, de entender esse fenômeno que já não é fácil entender, e ainda mais se dedicar a essa tarefa de pensar aqui fora, na condição de exilado, de imigrante, é, não é tão simples. Espero que eu não tenha deixado você angustiada com, a, com essa resposta, mas a gente precisa encarar também, assim, a, às vezes, a realidade dos fatos para a gente... É, tomar decisões é, corretas. Né? É, não estou dizendo aqui que não há esperança. Ah, sim, estamos todos nessa batalha, estamos conclamando todos, evocando todos os espectros né, que a gente possa levantar nesse momento, inclusive os espectros de Marx, para nessa luta contra essa, esse neoliberalismo, esse capitalismo destrutivo apocalíptico. Mas acho que é importante... Uh, because uh, we don't have um, we don't have sponsors. The the far right wing they have sponsors, and we don't have sponsors. And then we don't have weapons, digital weapons. We don't have, and we don't have the arms. We don't have the armed forces. We don't have a people to do that. And then we are very very. We are like um, uh, like. Um, like a birds, like a butterflies. We are very, very nice. We are the, the best people in the world, the, the, the left wing, but we are absolutely without any, any possibility to, to win this group, these groups, those, those groups. And uh, then I think we need to uh, organize the revolution and we need to, fight against capitalism, that, that is obvious. We need uh, another uh, a project to the world. We need uh, another world. <laughs> And then, um, but we need to, to move the um, desire of people. And desire of people is on Netflix. We, we have, people are in the Netflix, People are in the shopping centers. People are absolutely, um, absolutely uh, alienated. alienated. Yes, but uh, people are, uh, I think, uh, is worse because uh, they are esvaziados, uh, uh, emptied, emptied, empty, uh, empty, empty, empty uh, devoured by the, the this this. Uh, uh, mass culture, uh, um, this uh, 
in industry of culture uh, that uh, um, that are absolutely uh, against our uh, critical critical thinking and our uh, capacity to win uh, with critic with thought with uh, reflection uh, this situation then I, I think is a problem with our desire to our desire that could uh, that uh, should that could that should uh, produce a, a movement against uh, this situation uh, then is uh, there is uh, hope i think but uh, kafka said that that is uh, there there is hope but not for us and then we need to uh, to take this hope for us and th that is a problem um i'll just say something very quickly um, so yeah, what, what she said, it's, it's exactly that. But the problem is um, we must evolve and the world is evolving. Social media was gonna be here to stay. So the problem that I find in my social media is that it's very difficult to speak in a language that people would actually want to listen to you for more than 30 seconds. That's the thing, you know, like on, on social media, online platforms and Netflix and all these things, if, even if you go to, to Instagram, a reel has 60 seconds. People maybe watch 10 seconds of it and they already flick. Yeah. You know, people have absolutely no patience to watch anything, to learn anything. Yeah. And it just become like, it's very hard for academics because I like to study and I'm a little bit of a nerd. So even then I get anxious sometimes when people start doing very long videos and I'm just like, oh Jesus Christ. Like I fast forward to the bit that I wanna hear, you know? So we live in a society of anxiety. People are anxious, people have absolutely no time. And I think that if we're gonna win against fake news, we need to be smart and be able to reach the people like the fake news people do. They go to Instagram, they go to Facebook and they speak a language that people want to hear. And then you get the scientist. Hello everybody, I'm here to talk about, no one wants to hear that. It's boring. And then you get the fake guys and you're going, hi guys, I'm here to talk to you about this and that. And people are going to look at them and go, oh, I want to hear this guy because this guy's funny. He's interesting. So we need to speak the language of the people if we want to get into the brain. And this is what the fake news spreaders have got to a T. They are perfect at that. And I think that academics, we need to be better at speaking to people so we can get the message across. Okay. Well, we're going to have to wrap up in a minute, but I, I we talked about a lot of fake stuff. Uh, I, I want to talk about something very real uh, in here. We we do have some people in here. We do have a band called Francisco El Hombre. Francisco El Hombre, they did the soundtrack, the final track of my movie. They recorded a uh, wonderful rendition of Chico Buarque's Roda Viva, which is a film about how history is cyclical, how we keep repeating our mistakes. I would like to ask them to come to, to the front. They're right there at the back, and I would like them to come, come to the front and, and say hello to the audience. Well, all of you have got flyers on your desks. And uh, Francisco Alombre aren't just a, another band. Francisco Alombre are a very fast rising Mexican Brazilian band. They, they provide a very strong bridge between Brazilian music and Latin music. And also they are openly and unashamedly political the music is uh, incredibly engaged so it's no coincidence that they are part of the week of the fake news that i hope some of you or all of you will join us on saturday evening at the rich mix in in east london and see these guys sing and Talk about politics with their music. And um, 
that's all. I, I, well, obviously, I want you to thank Arthur for this amazing job. Julia, who is not to be seen, but she's been our interpreter. She works incredibly hard. It's not an easy job, and she doesn't get to be seen. So. And, uh, and it's, you. Uh, thanks to you that we're having this uh, this wonderful debate. So thank you for uh, for coming here on Thursday night. Hope to see you on Saturday with Francisco Alombre. I hope to see you on Sunday at the BFI for the coup d'etat factory. And thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who attended this event on the internet too, online, on, on Zoom. I hope you have enjoyed. Thank you, Victor, again. Thank you, Marcia and, and Priscilla and, and Jan for, for all the thoughts. It was a great night for everyone, I'm sure. Uh, so I see you next time again. I will stop the uh, streaming now. Thank you. Thank you.